They are going to hear you. In Beijing. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Lohan Academy Conversations, COVID-19, throwing a lifeline to SMEs and employment. This is Chen Lei, usually our anchor business shows on CGTN. Today, we are live streaming from the CGTN headquarters in Beijing. And joining us on the line from London is Mr. Christopher. Mr. Christopher Pissaridis, he is the Nobel Laureate Economist and also the Regius Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics. Also, we are pleased to have online uh, Mr. Min Zhu, Head of Tsinghua University's National Financial Research Institute and former Deputy Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. And of course, joining us from Hangzhou is Mr. Long Chen, Director of the Lohan Academy. Thank you for coming on this live stream with us, gentlemen. So before I launch into specific questions, I want to ask you, Chris, because you're in London and the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson will be resuming his duties tomorrow. What is the pandemic situation like over there? And also maybe give us some macro perspectives. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, very, very pleased to be joining uh, your group from London. It's early afternoon here in a very sunny spring day. Uh, the pandemic situation is still serious. There are still something like 850 deaths a day. But um, the curves that epidemiologists draw to show where it's going, they're showing some improvement. They're already, uh, they're already past their peak and they're turning down. So the expectation is that within um, a few weeks, we'll be able to, you know, when I say a few, maybe three, five weeks, we might be able to relax some of the restrictions. But currently, the restrictions are still in place in the way they were at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, after the whole economy is shut down. And the only people who are doing a very good business are, are delivery people, online shops, uh, you know, Amazon, which is our Alibaba, <laughs> talking of the know how academies doing experience their advance all over London delivery. Um, it, it's not, it's just not a normal situation. You know, we are allowed to go out once a day and take uh, long walks in the parks. It's absolutely the best time of the year to be doing that. You know, flowers out, trees getting green and, and all that. So it is enjoyable that we can do that. But even that in isolation, we're not supposed to come close to anyone. Uh, or engage in any kind of uh, activity outside other than exercise. So he, the, this is where we are. We have no exit strategy. Some of the other European uh, countries are already thinking of an exit strategy, a gradual a reopening of some businesses and schools. But in London, uh, we're still uh, not having a plan for that. I think the fact that the prime minister has been ill with the um, uh, coronavirus for uh, something like a month now uh, is having an effect on that. He's going to uh, say, look, this is very serious business. Don't take any risks uh, unless you absolutely have to. And when it's a matter of life or death, because he did, I mean, he, I mean his life did run you know, risks when he was in uh, intensive care. Um, despite the fact that he's a 55 year old healthy man. Um, we, we, the situation is likely to continue. Now, thinking about both uh, Britain, Europe, and the global economy in um, the macro performance, well, when at the beginning of the pandemic, people were asking me, you know, how long, uh, sorry, how serious is it going to be? I was always saying, well, it really depends on the duration of, of that, that this uh, situation has, because it is going to be short lived. And I have to say, I took a lot of encouragement from the experience of China, including uh, Hubei province, uh, that it was a matter of two months, maybe three months. Then I thought it wouldn't be too difficult for the economy to come out of a complete uh, lockdown after two or three months, uh, given the support that governments were provided in the, in, providing in the interim uh, period, uh, supporting employment and um, and, and businesses, SMEs that we'll be talking about a, a bit later. Now, it, it looks like it's going to be longer than that. Uh, so uh, I am getting a little bit more worried than I was at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, 
have to say. Um, I also have to um, confess that um, I'm very concerned about the way that the United States is uh, facing the pandemic, but I, I believe um, President Trump has been given uh, contradictory uh, advice, making contradictory claims. He's given too much authority to uh, state governors. The uh, federal government is, is advising, but not uh, forcing state governors to do things. And some of them are doing different things, like it's completely absurd, for example, that the governor of Georgia would open up the economy just because we're a free country, therefore do what you like. You know, here we're talking about people inflicting a, a deadly disease on others. Uh, just by going out and going to their shops. So what's the point of doing it? You know, what's the point of going and getting a haircut and risk your life or risk someone else's life? Just wait, there you grow. You know? um, and um, we like it or not, especially in Europe, we, we depend on a lot on good performance from the United States. You know, the usual saying of uh, the United States uh, sneezes and and Europe catches a cold or the world catches a cold is very much true still for us. So this is where we are. I believe there's more uncertainty now than, than I believe there would be at the beginning. I'm not too concerned by stock markets and asset prices and all that because those can be manipulated by central bank policy, by things people say, they depend on information that comes and goes. And, and, and anyway, Chen Long knows much more about these things in finances than than I do. What I'm concerned about is the real economy, you know, it's jobs, the future of work. And that currently looks more uncertain than I thought it would. Okay, so uh, Professor Pissaridis, you are now more concerned about the US handling. You're more worried in general about the pandemic's impact. And let's delve into the whole concept of SMEs because we are told time and time again, how important they are and how fragile they are and how they struggle with financing. So this is a terrible blow for the uh, SMEs around the world, which number about 500 million, 70% of total employment, about 50 to 60% of all value and make up 99% of all companies. So we know their importance. Now let's talk about how to help them. Um, because right now we've seen a slew of measures from different countries, ranging from tax breaks to direct payments to, to try to help them. So, you know, Professor Drew, with your wealth of experience in international policies and economics, um, you know, do you want to give us your assessment of what's being done now to, to help SMEs? Me. Yeah. I'm gonna hear you. Yeah, first of all, thanks for the invitation to join this uh, conversation, particularly with Chris. And it's good to see you, Chris. And uh, um, yeah, I think SOE hit the badly, and as you mentioned, because you know the 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 lockdown of the whole city and they stopped the whole and the people flow and the supply chain and the logistic supply and the materials, everything. Um, I think that's extremely hard for SME because we had, you know, surveys that shows and most of SMEs have roughly, you know, have cash flow for only for three months and they just cannot stand for more than three months. I think it's the most of them. Um, so it's ex extremely difficult and also when the whole world and run into this recession, the external demand is not there. It's also, it's very difficult for them. So I will say most of SOE in an extremely, extremely difficult time now. And uh, so what's the policy, yeah, as you mentioned? Basically, there are three types of policies. The first policy is a monetary policy to provide the liquidity to make sure the SME still have a cash income tax, you know, the, the, the insurance and the pension tax, the auto tax, the reduced the rent and also so a VAT. And so try to lower the cost of SM, SME uh, operation. And the thirdly, as the most of a direct help for them 
and uh, both in China cases, more from the local authorities try to arrange the labor force, you know, help them to get enough people back to the job, help them to get uh, uh, the logistic supplies, help them to hook with the supply chains, and also particularly with local issue consume, uh, consumption coupon, try to, you know, generate aggregate demand. So basically, I think that's the three things help them. But I will say at this moment for SME, because all those policies have a very strong assumption. The assumption is the company still run. Because when you reduce income tax, you reduce the VAT tax, you reduce the rent, that means the company still run. But I think the most difficult time at this moment is, is the company may not be able to run. So if a company not be able to run, I mean, the, the simple reason is don't, they don't have order, they don't have a demand, and also they don't have workers that cannot just come back to the office or for whatever the job, and they don't have a supply chain to support the whole thing. So all those policies may not work. So I think that that's the key issue uh, in my survey with more than 20,000 SMEs across South China. I think that's the key issue. This is also the key issue I observed in the United States, in Germany, and also uh, in UK in some degree. So the most important thing today, if you need a, a policy to help them, is to generate aggregate demand. I think the government need to generate aggregate demand to push for those firms to run. I think that that's the most important thing. And the second important thing is because the cost, the most important cost is labor cost. If the company have no order, but we still want to rescue those companies and make sure SME is still there, so we have to pay the labor cost. I think in UK, they pay roughly, Chris is here, right? 70, 80% the labor cost. And I think those things are very yeah. important. Yeah, I will stop here. Uh, no, it's okay. Um, so, Professor Chen, what do you make of that? You know, this whole assumption that we need companies, SMEs, to survive and also to help them lower their cost bases right, via generating that... aggregate demand. Uh, so, firstly, we we have to acknowledge that uh, saving the SME is like saving the economy. Uh, but this time, I think the nature of this pandemic economy is that uh, it's particularly unfavorable to the SMEs because we're really moving from the contact economy to the distancing economy, and it has to shut down. The problem is that huge chunk of the SME tends to be labor intensive. It tend, tends to be more contact oriented. Uh, so they will be hit particularly hard. And that's the first problem. Second problem is that uh, they are particularly weak in liquidity. So they, the relative to big companies, they don't last very long as just Ming just uh, mentioned. I think, I think the third problem is that even the government wants to support to reach them than to reaching the uh, bigger company. So for that combination, you mentioned that the SME accounts for the huge chunk of the economy. So I think that the nature of this pandemic is that uh, it's like a very long nightmare. So essentially, in order to make the, so just now being mentioned that we need to have the aggregate demand. So unfortunately, to control the pandemic, we have to shut down. The demand has to shut down. So it's like a very long, long nightmare. So the hope is that when we wake up, a large chunk of the economy is not damaged, is not permanently damaged, because it will take a long time to replace it. So, but then the SMEs are very uh, vulnerable to this shock. So I think they, at this point, we have to let the demand to shrink. So that's the biggest challenge. Then we have to let it recover as soon as possible to save the SME. So both, we have to win both battles. That's how difficult it is, but it is vital. Yes, Professor Drew, I wanna pick up on something Professor Chen just mentioned, which is that weak transmission of monetary and fiscal policies to SMEs, that difficulty that he mentioned. Um, how is China doing battling that challenge? 
Well, actually, in China, the transmission mechanism goes through the two channels. So one is goes through all the, the commercial banking systems, right? Because a central banker- uh, Which uh, traditionally isn't the... very friendly to SMEs. No, actually, when central bank cut the reserve rates, it's a particularly target for SOEs and give a clear message to commercial bank to lend to SMOEs, I think that's very cool. And also central bank give a special liquidity to the commercial banks and so the earmark to the SMEs. I think that's one thing. On the physical policy side, also it's a very earmark, right? But in that sense, you need the SME come to the, the budget, the tax agent to, to fill the form to claim you know, their SMEs, they need those type of things. They have to go through all the process will take some time. So in, in, in case many small companies also think the process is too lengthy. And uh, the third channel is more from the local authority. They are quite active because they understand the importance for SME for the local employment, for growth, and uh, for social and economic stability. So they try to mobilize their resource to try to reduce the rents, to reduce the local tax, local fee, and to support from the aggregate demand. So with those all three channels, I think uh, they, they worked, but obviously not perfectly. I think that's the key issue. Now there's a one way we probably can think about that out of the box to uh, think about a new transmission mechanism, which is used the uh, CBDC. The CBDC is a central bank digital currency, which is the concept has been talked for, for quite a few years. In China, we start to talk about in 2017, even a little earlier, right? I mean, if a central bank have a CBDC systems can directly give the credit, I mean, the, the credit and the money down to every person who need help and down to the every company who need help. Um, so I think this is type of a challenging environment may provide a well positioned incentive for central banks to start seriously and to build as quick as they can the CBDC system. Okay, before we drill down on digital innovation in this time of crisis, I wanna ask you, Chris, what do you make of the rescue policies uh, in the UK for SMEs? Well, the, the rescue pol policies here are basically ones trying to uh, get SMEs to survive the, um, the lockdown and then they come out and do their business you know, because it's two pronged in a, in a way. One of them supports the uh, employees by 80%, as you mentioned uh, before, you know, they give the company 80% 80 of the cost of uh, employees. Um, and then um, they get very low uh, loans uh, from the government, probably the most essential actually, because what uh, SMEs and their owners have to realize now is that there is no way that anyone could provide the demand they need to uh, start making money in all that if they're not involved in uh, online business or, or, or selling things that can be delivered uh, to the home. Um, so their best hope is that they have enough liquidity to pay their ongoing uh, costs like uh, rents, insurance, and so on. Uh, and of course, those providers have to be more flexible during this time. And the other one is not to dismiss their employees and then not be able to find them to rehire them and then start a new hiring process, which really takes long in labor markets because labor markets don't move as fast as uh, financial markets, for example. We'll talk a lot more on the friction in labor markets in yes, uh, exactly. just a little bit, yes. which is uh, your theory, which won you the uh, Nobel Prize. Yes, too many, too, too many frictions in labor markets. That it's, it's much faster to, uh, for labor markets to move down than it is to move up. That's it's this asymmetry that uh, I spend most of my life modeling and, uh, and working on. And, and we see it all the time. And, and that's why. Uh, this furloughing of, of employees, you know, paying a percentage, which is 80% uh, currently is so important is to avoid this lag in the recovery that we usually see. Um, now, of course, 
we were talking about SMEs in general, there are things that we might um, bear in mind. The first one is that, uh, I mean, SMEs come and go all the time in normal circ circumstances. You obviously don't want to support SMEs that had problems before that may be closing down and keep them going. So that, that's one thing governments might pay attention. It's not completely discriminate support that you want, but you want them to target a, a certain, um, uh, or avoid, avoid supporting certain types of SMEs. The other one is that um, th there are SMEs that um, could continue operating here. Uh, for example, once selling things, although they may not have their own uh, delivery system, logistics set up before, uh, they could join a platform uh, for exchange. Uh, they could be doing it. They could be selling through the platform. There are SMEs of that kind here joining the Amazon platform, for example, and, and selling. So that's another uh, thing they might consider. And, and again, there might be what you might call a free rider problem or a dead weight loss for the government where they might see, well, you know, look at all the support that others are getting. They're getting their employee costs. Let's pretend that we have problems too, although there might not be uh, contact SMEs. You know, even before the crisis, we had uh, SMEs located in warehouses in some obscure parts of the country um, using platforms to, to, to deliver goods to London, for example. So all those, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's not an easy issue, I have to say. And then, of course, we have to face the problems um, at the end of it, that there might be SMEs being confronted with heavy, being confronted with, with heavy debts. And I think government should support at that point as well uh, to let them get back in, in, into business, you know, extend the loans for a longer period, maybe write off some of the loans. <laughs> Because if you think about it, what does it mean when we write off a loan? It means that we get the taxpayer to pay uh, for that money, for, for, the, for those costs. And, and, and it's fair enough, you know, taxpayers who are currently sitting at home doing absolutely nothing and getting paid a salary. There's no reason why they should be paying uh, a surcharge, some kind, you know, an extra tax to pay- An equitable redistribu redistribution. Well, well, yes, because, the, uh, and those could co still collect our mm -hmm. streets, still clean uh, up uh, the streets, they drive vans day and night for deliveries. And there are others who just sit at home drawing a full salary and not doing anything. And, and it's only fair that those would be taxed more at the end of it to pay for those who are, who are working extremely hard or are building up debts so that their jobs survive to. Um, few months from now when uh, hopefully they're going back to work. Professor Chen, come in on this. Do you think China should do something similar? I, you see that China has benefited from a couple of things. One is that it has this natural uh, spring festival holiday. And so it's kind of natural shutdown, partly shutdown. Second is that it has moved quickly so that uh, relative to other countries, so it's the, um, the, the problem is not as severe at this point. And so, but I think coming to this subject, I've been willing to talk about the, there's a lot of different methods have been taken uh, globally to deal with the helping the SMEs. But let me cite several things. So firstly, I think most of the Western countries, the governments have very clear attitude. They're gonna uh, use everything they can to help every SME if possible. So the then they use the fiscal monetary policy to unprecedented amount of that. But there's a lot of interesting ways to do this. For example, uh, firstly, is to protect the, the wages. Let me give you one example. One example from Germany. So they have this uh, uh, part, part working program so that uh, if the companies apply for this program, they don't fire the, the workers. They only work part time, then the governments will pick up uh, quite, quite up the residual uh, wages. In the United States, they have this 350 billion wage production plan financing. So essentially, it's it's very similar idea. So essentially, it has to it guarantee the the the, the wages so that uh, so that you, so that you, you you don't fire people. So one is the protect employment and wages directly. The second uh, channel I think is to help 
is through the lending. Now the United States, they have this 300 billion plan. Uh, they, it's, it's fun. Oh, let me come back to the first point. So they actually let the banks to have the, use the money to help the companies. Then the, the, the banks turn around to use, to actually to, the, the central banks will provide the lending to the two of the banks. So ultimately it's the central bank who's paying off the bill the, through, the, through the banks to the SMEs. The second channel is the lending, direct lending. So they have this 300, 600 billion plan that is meant to fund uh, companies with relatively good health, small companies. As for, for the lending, only 5% of the lending will be uh, taken by the banks. The 95% of that goes to the Federal uh, Reserve. Okay, so they also try to save the junk bond market, which is the kind of the lending by the not so good companies. Not so, and also, of course, the, as uh, uh, Professor Drew mentioned, the cut interest rate, uh, United States to zero, the, the benchmark interest rate. So that's trying to uh, lower the, the, the rate. So that's the lending financial costs. The third rule is through the, the so-called furlough. So essentially you can uh, let the works uh, do not work without pay. So in return then they can apply for unemployment benefits and that can last uh, uh, several months. You know, to, uh, in the United States it can last for four months to help them to, to survive. And the fourth way is to send cash directly to the families. In the United States for for, for the a, a family, if you have kids, you can have the uh, uh, cash up to like close to $3,000. The first way is through tax delay or deduction. So you can delay your ta taxation. And uh, so that's the uh, fifth way. Now the sixth way is that actually in some countries, for example, in, in, in actually um, Spain, uh, if you ha they have 3 million self-employed employed workers, so you, are, you do not belong to a company, but actually you can claim for unemployment benefits now, which was not before. So that's the part. And finally, if you are unemployment, unemployed, you can actually delay paying the bills. So my point here is that the many, many creative ways that are combined with the very aggressive fiscal and monetary policies to try to save the SMEs. So, Professor Drew, how do you know if these policies are working and how do you actually adapt some of these policies to fit, best fit the needs of your economy? Well, I mean, the, the two things. Number one, if the whole uh, economy is hit by this pandemics, right, it's close, growth is slowing down, and then obviously SME were hit and accordingly. So it's not a measure, but uh, the real issue is, so we have to take that part up because that's the big picture, right? Even with the policy and support, we just cannot avoid the overall shock from the global uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic shock, right? I think that's, we have to take that part. But the real, a good measure is uh, unemployment rate. If unemployment rate is way high, that means SMA is closing. Uh, so that means SME is really, really in bad shape. So I think that's clear indicate for that. And uh, back to uh, the point that Chris and uh, Chen Long mentioned, you, you also mentioned compared to international policies, I think they're more or less the same, provided liquidity, as I mentioned earlier, right? More or less the same. Reduce the cost in, in, in the sense, cutting the interest rates, you know, cutting the tax rates, cutting the social security payments, all those things. I mean, they are more or less the same, so they're different. But China has a, Something I think that many other countries like Germany, UK, US don't have is a support from local authority. The local authority play a key role in China to in supporting the SMEs. They provide the free rents, provide the logistic support, arrange local sort of financing for SMEs, 
and organize transportation for labor force. I mentioned that before, I think they don't have that. But in China, we don't have one thing in many outside of uh, Chinese countries uh, they have that's a directly pay for the worker. For example, in UK, they can pay if the company agree to not lay up the worker, they can pay up to 70% their salary. In Germany, they pay roughly 80%. In the United States, you can apply for a SME credit, but if you use this credit to pay the next eight weeks, the work's wage, rent, and water electricity costs to make sure your company still run, you may get fully and uh, uh, covered Free by first. all the court. Yeah. So that means at the end, you may not necessarily to pay the loan back. So I think that that's a slight difference uh, between uh, 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 China and others. So why doesn't China do that? Well, that's us. So there's a lot of uh, uh, debating and, and uh, see whether I will do that because you really need a good system and make sure and the money will transform to the company to the hand in the hands of the worker. In US, it's really a small business agent who is really in charge of and promote all the development of SMEs who handle their things. So they got roughly more than a million applications. They will be able to spend roughly $350 billion in four days, right? Um, so you need a system to support this type of things. You need an infrastructure. And Professor Chen, what about the role of digital technology in helping these SMEs? For example, internet banks, you know, giving loans to SMEs, approving them within minutes. Right. I think the, uh, in retrospective, I think it's almost unthinkable if we are not in the digital age, think about how we're going to deal with this. But even directly, uh, because the nature of the pandemic economy is the distancing economy. And uh, digital technology is meant to overcome this challenge from distance. So it plays a huge role by fighting against the pandemic itself. But now let's think about the, uh, how it can help the, uh, help the SMEs and, and, and average people. But let me give you some concrete examples. I'm just using the Ant Financial as one example, but probably there are many digital platforms that are doing this. And so if you look at Ant Financial, it has provided uh, a 10 billion uh, zero interest rate on the loans to online sellers and then it has also provided the, the loans to uh, more than 360,000 online sellers from Wuhan. And, and they can get the loan from their mobile phone. And so that's just direct accessibility to, to them. And so it also has provided uh, loans to SMEs for more than uh, 1.8 million SMEs uh, uh, directly. Then also, it has helped the more than has helped 25 financial institutions, the banks, to, to provide loan to uh, to to, uh, um, to 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 uh, provide loan to more than 8.5 million SMEs with with 80 percent of the uh, normal interest rate level. So reduction of interest rate, but also help the traditional banks more than 85, 8.5 million SMEs. And also the, another part is the uh, boosting the consumption. So in, probably have heard in China, they have this uh, consumption coupon programs nowadays. Uh, Ant Financial has helped to distribute those coupons in more than 50 cities and have, has helped to move. Uh, uh, so let me give you one example in a city, it's Zhenzhou. So it actually helped to distribute uh, a coupon worthy of uh, 30, 39 million RMB, but actually it helped to, to stimulate 550 million spending of consumption. The multiply, multiplier effect. Exactly, a very huge multiplier effect. It helps the cons consumption, as the Professor Drew mentioned, as, and also ha directly have the, have the cash distributed to, for consumption to the, uh, to the individuals. And uh, another part is the helping to 
for the flexible employment. Uh, unfinished has helped more than 1.6 million people adopt temporary employment through Alipay. And 90%, 90% of them from heavily hurt industries like the restaurants, uh, you know, the hotels, those industries, they temporarily can find the jobs. Uh, so it also has created many new on-demand jobs. So we can see that the digital technology helps to get access to the SMEs, to a lot of the individuals, help them to overcome the financial difficulties and help them to actually find new jobs, really reallocate re resources. A lot of things can be done through the digital technology. Your comments, yeah. Professor Drew. Oh, yeah, Chris. Uh, so, no, no, I was going to say, okay, I've got something here. You know, of course, China in the, is way ahead in the use of uh, digital technologies. And as, um, as, as Jack Mice is uh, like saying, and he's absolutely right, is that because there was no long tradition of uh, an established culture of, of, of China's business banking, especially in China. So when a digital bank goes in, uh, they leapfrog. Yeah, then, then you can use it. Now, I, I think this is one area where the pandemic is going to have a long-term effect um, on, on Western economies because there's been a lot of resistance here from many people to move on to the, the digital way of doing um, business, the financial business, as well as others, because they're saying, oh, you know, I have my, uh, my banker, I have my suppliers, I meet them in person, I'm absolutely happy, why, why should I change? The same with people going to the banks, you know, there are still uh, high uh, banks in the high streets, in, uh, in commercial areas, you say, well, I go there, I do my business, what's the point of learning all these, you know, downloading apps and learning all these new techniques? Well, now, for the last um, five weeks where we've been locked down, they've been forced to do that, you know, there's been lots of information sent from the um, uh, suppliers from the companies saying, you know, we can still continue doing their business online. We're doing everything we can. You know, I've got loads and loads of those that uh, I was registered with them as customers in one way or another, you know, through credit card use in the past or whatever. And you're forced to use it. And once you use it, you realize how much better it is, you know, how much time you save. It's objective. You don't get worked up about using public transport or, or, or whatever. And then you can use that time to, to do other things, you know, it's amazing how much time it frees up. And that's going to have a permanent um, impact on uh, our economies and the way we're doing businesses uh, over in Europe in particular, which has a very long tradition of established of doing business in other ways. And um, it's going to bring this um, structural transformation in the, in the use of technology in, in favor of uh, digitalization over here as well. Uh, which is quite interesting because it was a small process and, and um, companies and banks and governments were planning on a slow transition. And suddenly when they're going to wake up at the end of this uh, emergency and realize that the ones that thought was going to take a long time are behind the times and the others are still in their businesses. So that would be very interesting to observe in fact as to what's happening. Yeah. Professor Drew, do you also see this structural transformation taking place around the world? Uh, I want to get your take on the value of digital technology in assisting SMEs. Well, I think digital technology obviously played a very important role in assisting and help SMEs during this crisis, right? And they through a few different channels. Number one, most of sort of for digital financial institutes like uh, uh, Ansa Finance, like Weizong, Baixing, you know, all those financial institutes are quickly, you know, getting the special support, the credit line to SMEs and also cut rates to a low level as uh, Cheng Long mentioned, right? I think that that's the one thing, which is also part of the central bank's monetary policy, right? Because they get the support from commercial bank and also from central banks so, and they will be able to land because they have more liquidity. So I think that's the one thing they do. Now the second thing they do is very unique. The unique in the sense because they are platform. So those digital companies use their platform to help SMEs in providing 
for example, informations, providing logistic information, providing supply chain service, and providing meeting service and uh, online office service, and, uh, and also in many cases provide cloud and uh, usage for free. Now, I think that has been very helpful and very much appreciated by SME on, in, in China, which is also new. The, the sense is new in the whole world because only in China we have a, such a strong digital economy and a platform be able to provide service support SME. Now, that's a third channel also interesting just happened in the past few days. The local authority through the, the, the platform, the e-commerce platform to distribute consenting coupon. Now, I think that's also very interesting things. It's a good in the sense those platform also sell different things. So the coupon very much meet the need they, I mean, their business and their SMEs need. So I think that's also, also good. So it seemed to me, this is a special targeted the policy to serve, to help a certain group of SME through the e-platform which is also very good. But I think it's still too early to say, because it's a crisis, we see an overall transmission of uh, digital economy and e-commerce as well. I think the more important things that we probably will see move into the more AR, more 5G, more uh, 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 sort of internet of thing type of things. A rather just a simple e-commerce to provide service to SME. All right, I want to pose a question to you gentlemen about the future competitiveness of SMEs because we live in a world where big is often seen as better. You get more resources, you get more financing, you have stronger brands and then you become too big to fail so you get bailed out. So how do SMEs restore their competitiveness after the blow of this pandemic? Chris, let's start with you. Well, you know, I mean, you say big is, is beautiful. I mean, I mean basically, the, the way business is moving depends very much on what facilities they have for their uh, logistics, for reaching out to their uh, customers, and all that. And, and, I mean, there's always um, a, an ideal size, if, if you like, for any company, which is not easy to uh, reaching you know, there is no magic one that will tell you this is your ideal size but what it tells you it depends on the abilities of the manager you know what we call in economy the span of control of the manager it, it depends on the type of product that they sell on the type of market they operate in and um, where SMEs will succeed very quickly it's if they pitch it at the right level for for what they are doing you know obviously if they try and and, and compete, with uh, a company that um, can access the entire country online, you know, if you, if you a platform that access it online, if not internationally, they're going to fail. They're not going to be competitive, but there are many, we still live in an era where there are many locally provided uh, services, especially take medical services, take uh, advice, take uh, domestic uh, services and all that, where, SMEs, we always have the advantage and, and, and the secret of success, if you like, in SMEs is to, is to target the areas where, uh, where the, the provision of the service of the product is uh, done at a lower cost uh, for a smaller size. The, I mean, the, the, the pandemic is not going to have any substantial impact in that, except to the extent that I was saying before that uh, it's uh, speeding up the development of uh, digital uh, business uh, uh, contact. And therefore they do need to move on to the new technology. But once you move on to the new technology, there will be a lot left that will be better done at a lower level than, uh, than a higher one. What, what we find, you know, the, the, what you mentioned before about too big to fail and all that is that what we are finding is not 
if you like, the whole economy moving on to a situation where a bigger company is always at an advantage in every uh, different part of the business landscape. What we're finding is that those that were already uh, high at the, at the table, they, they are becoming even bigger, becoming global rather than the more, more if you like, than before. And, um, you know, like, I, I, I mean, I do know the Chinese situation a little, but not as well as I know the Western ones. So if I can use an example from, from the West, for example, you know, like, like 20 years ago, when computerization came on for the first time in software, everyone thought, well, there are advantages to having only one type of software internationally, and Microsoft became the dominant company, and it very quickly became the biggest company in the world. And everyone was saying, wow, look at them, and Bill Gates became it became the richest man in, in America, if not internationally. Currently, the, the, the big company is the, is the platform economy because it's, retail, it's, it's taking over retail trade and, and suddenly uh, Jim Benzos and uh, Amazon has overtaken Microsoft as the biggest company. It's even bigger than Microsoft and Benzos is now the richest man in America and all that. So that, 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 that's where we see the, the, very, the, the very big becoming bigger. But uh, the big numbers, like 70% unemployment you mentioned before, you know, the, the core of the local economy, you know, what I see when I walk out in my local uh, communities, business center, the community is, is still there and they will still be there because they offer a better personalized service. You know, the, I mean, the guy who sells me fish every day, for example, will always be small because he goes to the fish market in the morning. He chooses good stuff, he brings it here, I go there, I chat, he explains to me, he gives it to me and I enjoy my meal. <laughs> you know? Professor I, Chen, do you, do you believe do that the SMEs will retain the competitiveness? Uh, yeah, so I think uh, uh, Chris is the expert on employment, uh, a history of employment. So uh, look, now if we think about the the long-term impact of the pandemic, I think there are three things. One is the, this distancing stuff. So essentially, uh, and that raises a cost for every business, for big or small. So we can see that in the future, the economy will be relatively more fragmented, more distant, more diversified, uh, try to be more resilient, uh, care more about the security stuff. So that increases the business cost. So that's one thing distancing, and that shifts the allocation of the business, of the structure of employment. Now, second thing is that we still have to be coordinated. So even though we're more uh, uh, distant, we have to coordinate to, to, to face the common threats or the, uh, the, the, or, or the, or the things, like the, maybe in the future climate change, this or that. Now, but the third thing is the digitalization. I think the digital is the thing that puts everything together because it overcomes the distance challenge. Now, put together then, I think that creates a lot of the short-term pain, but it also creates a lot of the opportunities. Uh, so distancing itself, actually it creates the new demand for, uh, for example, cleaning services. We just have to clean up us, everything up all the time. And it, has, it provides very light medical services. We just have to check up a lot of things. We don't go to the hospitals. And we have, it provides new med, uh, medical checking service. And also we have to, be, uh, have to wear a lot of masks. So I think in the very near future, we're gonna wear very beautiful stylish mas masks. So we just have to wear this all the time. And how about delivery services? Uh, so my point here is that distancing economy create a lot of demand. So that's the, uh, that's just shift the, shift the business. The second part is the digitalization. Now, digitalization for big or small, all the companies have to go online. But so if we think about it, I think one good news is that nowadays, actually, there's, uh, the platforms actually helps a lot of those informal economies going online. You think about Taobao, right? Taobao.com. Taobao has more than 10 million SMEs. And a lot of the, like, they have several employees, but now you can serve people at 10,000 kilometers away, which was un impossible. So this is, it is precisely at the digital time. Those SMEs, those informal economies can go jump, jump over the industrialization, actually join the digital economy. So that's one type. The second type are the small startups. 
actually they are the ones I think Chris mentioned a bit, they often grasp a lot of new opportunities. The remote uh, education, uh, remote uh, medical care, fitness, entertainment, uh, niche e-commerce opportunities, uh, 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 stuff. So I think, I don't think history tells us all the time we worry about SMEs. Actually, they tend to be vulnerable every time there's a systematic shock, but somehow they come back. And so they, they become bigger. So they are still always there, but it's a, it's a pain in the short run. But I don't think uh, it, it changed. I don't think this pandemic would change that uh, the nature of that history. Professor Drew, in this distanced <laughs> and digitalized world, um, you know, Professor Chen thinks that SMEs might become more competitiveness, uh, more competitive. So uh, I want to get your summing up comments before we move on to the employment part of the discussion. Yeah, I think both Chris and Chen Long, you know, talk a lot about that. But I think you ask what about the futures of SME, right? But I think the first thing you think about the future is they have to survive today. I think that's the most important thing. If you cannot survive today, come on, you have no futures, right? But how, how can you survive in today it is a mindset change. I think that's the most important thing. Because for SME, in the long term, that's a part of the supply chain. They follow the mainstream. They got order. They, they just, you know, being a producer, right? They do the uh, OMA. And, uh, but now with this change, they have to go back to themselves and think about it and what world will change, what the industry will change, what the company will change. I think that's very important things. Also, they have to think about the little bit of a long-term stress test. It seemed to me this pandemic crisis can last for quite long. I mean, if you're looking for globally, that's more than 2 million, right? But uh, we're still in exponentially increasing paths in quite many countries. It seemed to me this pandemic will move like a wave in Europe, you know, from Italy, Spain, move to Germany, France, and the UK, and the Nordic, and the US, moving from, say, New York to Maryland, to Virginia, to DC, down to uh, Florida and the West to the California. So when you're moving around, as it also could move to the Africa and the South Asia. When you have those wave sort of a development, there's a pretty big chance to have a second hit. That's the 1918s, the Spanish flu. So that means the pand pandemic will live with us for quite a long time. So for SMEs, you have to think a medium term and a long term strategy to survive. Think about tomorrow, which is also the part of the strategy for surviving today. We all talk about digitalization, but it seems to me digitalization is obviously right, but mean quite a few things for SMEs. For example, I think the SME will, move, will work more with the platform rather than the, 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 the supply chain. For example, they will move more the internal operation to online. Like, uh, you know, they can outsourcing e even, right? Many, you know, accounting, finance, designing, training, marketing, all those things with today's experience, you can move them to online. I think that's also a very important thing. But the most important thing I think with this crisis, SMG think about the flexibility. Before, they're a small part of the big supply chain, but now it's a vertical, but you have to think about horizontally. You have the flexibility to moving into a different product line and work with a different supply chain and at the end work with a platform. So I think those are all the mean of 
digitalizations and obviously employ the artificial intelligence and internet of things to improve the quality process is also the part of the game. Now, those the future, but I would like to also emphasize is also today's strategy. Unless you can adapt to those strategy today, you probably will not be able to survive this crisis. So then you yes. have no, no future. So you have to start think about your new strategy today and start working immediately the new strategy right now. For sure, think long-term, think um, being resilient. So let's move on to the employment part of our discussion. And I wanna ask you, Chris, because obviously you won the Nobel Prize for your equilibrium uh, employment theory. So, you know, what do you make of the policies that are being unleashed around the world to protect employment right now? But employment uh, ne needs to be protected because as we mentioned before, it will not be easy for companies that uh, stop operating now to rehire. They might need to retrain. They won't be finding their old employees. It's going to be a very slow process. And um, that of course, will slow down the recovery of the economy as well. That's why we have governments like uh, German, British, and all that, that pay 80%. And by the way, the, the subsidy in Britain is also 80%. I think Professor Xu mentioned up to 70, but in fact, they are given 80. Uh, although it might sound a lot, you know, you might say, why is government paying 80% of the cost of the company? It's, um, it, it, it is fully justified. It, it's essential to keep the people attached to their old jobs. Uh, where they know the skills and where they'll be able to come back into uh, work quickly. It, I, I mean, you know, you mentioned frictions before. It's a way of bypassing the frictions in the labor market, in fact. And I'm sure it's going, it's going to be something that economists will study for many years to come because everyone is like, accepts that there are frictions that slow down the recovery of the labor market. And, and here is one way of doing it. You, you basically um, the, you, you mothball employment, as, as you might say, you know, you put it into mothballs, they survive there without um, getting attacked by any moths or anything, and then they quickly come back into production. So the uh, work sharing arrangements that we've seen in... Um... That, no, that, that, that's, not, that's not a friction reduction. In, it's more of, a, of providing a temporary help uh, for the employees. It, this also goes back to something we said before that, uh, that there are some jobs that have become a lot busier and uh, jobs on the platform are much busier, jobs in the health sector are much busier, whereas loads and loads of jobs have become much less busy, if not completely idle. And um, what they're doing there is to say, you know, it's, it, it's a pure coincidence if your job happened to be one that the uh, pandemic has made a, a lot busier. So why not share it out? We don't get to exhaust you, we don't put you into any risks, and you involve someone else in, into the work. So that work sharing is more of a way of, of sharing the burdens, if you like, across uh, the labor market. What bypasses the friction is something that um, it keeps you attached to a place or offers you a new type of job that is going to survive beyond the uh, pandemic. And you know, taking a restaurant working now to work on the platform economy is unlikely to survive beyond the pandemic because beyond that, uh, then the platform can go back to its normal business and the restaurant will open and, he, and that's where he has his expertise. Obviously, some people might make new discoveries in life. They might discover new comparative advantages they have and, and all that and go in. But on the whole, people will want to go back to doing what they were doing uh, before. Um, now, th th there will be some restructuring, of course, of uh, jobs because of this, mainly because of digital. I think um, uh, Long was mentioning um, something about cleaning services, for example, which is a contact job. That, that, that actually is a very interesting one because uh, loads and loads of um, has, in fact, it's interesting if we just give me two minutes to go back to the history. You see, when, when um, countries first started industrializing and becoming wealthier, they, 
which was before, at least in Europe and North America, it was before the um, uh, big discoveries of uh, domestic appliances and all that, you know, beginning of the 20th century. Then uh, households, you know, middle class households would have lots and lots of employees who would come and do their work. You would have someone who would come to do your washing, your laundry, someone to clean your house, and, and all that. And then all these uh, consumer durables came along, you know, washing machines, cookers, dishwashers, that took the jobs away from those. And you know, they were called the engines of liberation of, the, of, of, of human labor and all that. But we, we still have a lot of domestic work, people coming to clean our houses. Well, what, what this pandemic has made many, has made many people discover, including my, <laughs> including my household, actually, that you can do your own cleaning? No, well, yeah, well, of course, yeah, you can use your muscle power for a change, which, which I'm using extensively, actually. But you can buy a little robot cleaner about this big. The Roomba, yeah. Cleaner in the same time, you just, without even worrying, you just press the button, you switch it on, and you go back and do your other things, and then go in two hours later and discover that you are lit. Little robo cleaner is uh, sitting there in its uh, station getting charged for the next cleaning job. So, this ties in with the question that we're getting from CBN newspaper, which is Are you concerned about structural unemployment rising in the post coronavirus world? Well, it, it, exactly. That's, that's going to create this, uh, this kind of change. We created a, a, at least a temporary structural unemployment. Um, in that those people will have to find other jobs because they might uh, wake up after the uh, pandemic and say, right, I'm ready, let's pull back all the, because, you know, still, uh, still needs to be done by human hands. The but Japanese are working on that. I'm really cleaning because we have two or three robots doing all that work in our house, you know. And so, so that, that that's going to be a, a, a permanent change, I think, in the way we do business, a lot of contact uh, jobs will be automated. Let uh, me bring you in, Professor Drew, on this. Uh, first, on the job protection policies from various governments, your take, and also on the possible impact on long-term employment post-coronavirus. Yeah, those are two very interesting, but really confront to each other issues. Let me explain why. I mean, job protection is absolutely, absolutely important because every worker is a father, a mother, a brother, or a sister, right? So it's alive and they have a family. So protect the job, protect the employees, it really helps to maintain the social stability and the manager and maintain the family. So I think it's really, really important. But the, the German policy also, in the same sense, is controversial because you pay 80% the salaries. So as Chris mentioned several times in his talk, he says they're supposed to go back to do what they to do right before. So that means the assumption is after coronavirus crisis, everything will go back to normal. But in fact, so far, what we observe is the post coronavirus period could be very different. Let's come to your second point. Because the people's behavior may change. Because supply chain, the global or regional location may change. Because the digitization will move even faster. Because the, move, the adaptation of artificial intelligence and international uh, internet of thing and those type of things, 5G will be faster. So bring them together, I can see clearly they will have a structure and employment issues in the post coronavirus crisis period. So in that sense, I think the government need to play a very important role to fix this fraction in the labor market. In the sense to provide the short-term insurance to help people to manage this very difficult periods. In the sense, provide information 
to match the demand and surprise in the sense, most importantly, provide the training. Because I can see, particularly in China situation, when China moved from labor intensive manufacturing economy to a high tech and a manufacturing economy and the labor structural change is inevitable, become ever, ever more important. So I think a government should and will play an important role in this regard. Professor Chen, I'm interested in your perspective. Now, if we only look at the, the short-term shocks, or at least see that the shock is uneven. So, for example, we'll talk, if you look at the, the service industry, you can see that with China's uh, GDP number for the first quarter just came out. And so, of course, the service industry was badly hit, but it's very uneven. So in the restaurant industry, it was hit like minus 35%. Then you're going to have the finance. It's like it has actually a positive growth, like two or three percent. Then you have the technology sector that grows still in double digits. And so we also observe actually people are still hiring, especially, for example, in the technology sectors, help people to do the operation, going online, uh, doing the marketing, all this other. So my point here is that even just for the short term shocks, it is uneven. But if we think about short and shocks, come back to what uh, uh, Chris mentioned in the beginning, uh, duration ma matters a lot. I think because we know traditionally, we, we know in macroeconomics, there's negative relation between the uh, GDP growth uh, and the unemployment rate. So if, if your GDP growth is like shrink, shrink maybe by 1%, your unemployment rate might go up like 0.5%. And uh, historically, we know that if the GDP shrink by 10%, it takes like on average like five years to recover. So that what my point here is that the slower the economy recovers, the longer the duration, the more employment will be hurt. And that's the, the, the short-term part. The long-term, we already talked a lot about the digital transformation. Everybody has to transform, but I, I'd like to add a little interesting piece to Professor Drew's comments that training is important. So I think that's another interesting thing that is the actually digital technology can help quite a bit in the training part. Uh, we, we did, uh, uh, there was a, a, a study uh, several years ago, look at the, the, the rural uh, entrepreneurs, uh, if they actually, if they work in those Taobao village. Now, if they are actually, they have like primary school education, but they actually involve into e-commerce, they actually fare as well as those with the college education, but, but are not involved into the e-commerce. My point here is that on the one hand, you do need uh, training. That's absolutely important. On the other hand, actually, digital technology has so much reduced the threshold for training. So think about kids. Nowadays, a two-year kid can play video games. And the digital natives, yeah. Exactly. So, so there's uh, two forces balance each other. So my point here is I think training is important, but what's more important is get them somehow involved into the, into the game, into the market. So they actually, that will entice them tremendously. But in the meantime, I absolutely agree that we have to support the, the vulnerable. The people are more uh, hurt in the transition. Chris, I want to talk about your theory and how it relates to labor policies because the friction that you discover means that you have persistent unemployment, you have wage differences even with similar workers, you have uh, you know the coexistence of unemployed workers and also vacant jobs within certain markets. So how does that relate to the challenges that we face now? Well, if, well first you have to see all those problems that you mentioned, what can we do about them in normal times, you know, before we have any uh, problems with the pandemic? And, and what you might say there, it's uh, to a large extent a, a question of information, it's a question of uh, a training programs provided uh, to, to the workers. You need guidance from government because it's not something that uh, if you leave enterprises alone, 
they will do it to a satisfactory extent. And that's what's really occupied uh, us doing research in that area because we never expected uh, to find such a pandemic. Now, the way you would see the pandemic now in the more general terms, if you like, in the abstract, is that it's a big shock to the economy, to that uh, way of doing things that we're thinking before, you know, let people first look for a job on their own. If they cannot find one, invest in life, write them uh, the trainings you need to support them in the meantime, in case they have to withdraw. It's something that takes time because you don't want to make mistakes because they can be very costly. Now there is this pandemic where things have to be done quickly because we have to get the economy back quickly. It's, it's, it's going into a complete uh, shutdown, which we hadn't experienced before. Um, so we need to start thinking outside the, the box that we were thinking, uh, that we've been thinking up to that time, you know, up to two or three months ago. And, the, and, and I have to say there is a lot of work going on in that uh, because obviously no one uh, knew. Uh, I mean, I've contributed a little bit uh, without myself with um, some of my former PhD students uh, writing uh, for uh, journals that were published uh, quickly online. And um, we're moving in that direction to um, devise sort of new policies, new ways of, of providing this uh, help quickly. But as I was saying before, one um, very important ingredient of that is that instead of um, letting companies make people unemployed and then giving them strong support to find a job that is suitable to their skills, you know, to look for a good match, in other words. You are better off spending that money, if not a little bit more, to keep them where they are now and not uh, congest the market with lots of people coming in and, and needing to do a lots of job search and, and, and having to do that match, uh, that matching problem between workers and jobs to such a big scale because congestion does matter in these markets they could cause problems and once you keep them in place then give the support for any training through the employer rather than directly to the to, to the worker speaking of congestion professor drew china's eight million college graduates entering the job market this year how do we help them and what would be your advice to these new job seekers? That's a real, real challenge for China today because when you have the whole economy slowing down, right? The first quarter drops 6.8%. And, and the most important thing, the future is so uncertainty, right? I think uh, really not many company will reopen to have a big hiring at this particular moment. I think that from the business community side, they are facing a few things. Number one, the current growth is slowing down. So they have to cut their scale. The demand is an, 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 an a shrinking and the near term future is also not all clear. So the only thing they will do is cut the cost, right? So they will hold on their new highs. So I think that's created a very difficult situation for this eight million new grads that will come out the, 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 the college gate to celebrate their graduation and run into a very bad market. Now, which is a very bad situation. Once again, um, I think we need a policy to bridge their current job searching and their future because when China moving into a high tech economy, more like a Germany's technology manufacturing and the AR and the 5G times, we need those college graduates. I think those are the most important labor force for the futures. So make sure we will be able to preserve that capital. I think that's the short term game and to make sure they find a proper job as a medium term goal for both the government, I mean the central and the local, for college and for the company. So I think that there are many things that each part can do 
the school should make more efforts to the outreach, to talk to the company, to, and, uh, to solicit those companies and come to school and because they know students well. And the governments also needed to play an important role to provide the incentive to the company to hire these new college grads. I think that's also important. This is the same thing like uh, Germany today pay 80% of salary for the SME employers as well. Just want to make sure these people still remain in the market and uh, not lost their skill and a law or so. I think that's also and very important. But meanwhile, a midterm training program expand the graduate program so transform part of this paper into the higher degree study so they prepare for the future is also could be another policy as well. So there are things we certainly can do and to help these people, but it's not only to help these people, it's really to help the economy and to help the future of the China. Professor uh, Chen, oh, uh, Chris. I, I, I just wanted to come in and, um, and say, you know, what I talked about before, concerns mainly in employment before or where we're in the labor market. The big problem, of course, would be faced by new entrants into the labor market, as uh, Professor Zhu was saying. And um, I, I should say that, um, but in a way, you know, I mean, they do need help and government needs to provide help, but, uh, but we have to accept that, that, that the current cohort, that they've just been very unlucky to be completing their studies now. It's a, it, it's a little bit similar, but maybe even worse with those who were uh, graduating during the financial crisis and they were studying finance. You know, they, they got stuck. In fact, I, I have a son of my own who was finishing with finance in 2008. And I could see that he, he was just being very unlucky to finish studies in finance exactly the year of the financial crisis. And it's the same here, you know, you finish your studies in a year that, um, that the economy is, is shut down. So the, the So how did you advise him? Well, I, I mean, that's the thing, whatever you say to him, it will not be good.